Good morning, sir. Good morning. Today's first witness is Mr. Jarosh. Okay. Would you like to stand up, please, Mr. Jarosh? Take the Bible and just repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please sit down. Good morning. Can you give your full name, please? Mark Yarosh. Uh, Mr. Yarosh, you should have in front of you a bundle containing a witness statement. Um, is that statement dated the 9th of August of this year? Yes, I have. Yes. Could I ask you to turn to the final page, page 21 of 22? Okay. Uh, and is that your signature there? Yes, it is. Thank you. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, it is. Thank you, Mr. Jarosh. I'm going to ask questions on behalf of the inquiry today. Uh, thank you very much for attending today, and thank you for your witness statement. The, the witness statement uh, for the purposes of the transcript is WITN 04810100. Uh, that statement and the exhibits will all go into evidence, and what I'm going to ask you today will build upon what's already in there. Um, I, I think we'll probably be... Ad half a day, possibly less. Um, I'm going to start with your background. Uh, you joined ICL in 1983, is that right? Uh, yes, it is. And you became employed by ICL Pathway, or what became ICL Pathway? Yes. Um, and you started as a customer support executive? I did, yes. And then you became involved in Horizon from 1995 to 2012, is that right? Yes. Um, so you were involved before even ICL had succeeded in the procurement exercise? Yes, I was. Um, in 1996, you became a solution architect networking. Is that right? Uh, yes, it is. That was my role, yeah. That was your role. Um, and, and that was Legacy Horizon, or what's now known as Legacy Horizon. Yes. Um, and then in 2010 to 2012, you were a solution architect um, security. Was that in relation to Horizon Online? Yes, it was. Um, you're still employed by Fujitsu, is that right? I am, yes. Yes, and your title now is Lead Domain Architect? That's correct. Um, presumably, you still have access, therefore, to Fujitsu records and things like that. Um, e yes, par partially, I do, yeah. Um, and you're represented today and assisted by the Fujitsu legal team? Yeah, I am. Um, can we bring up on screen your witness statement? It's WITN 04810100, please. Now, this statement was provided in response to a Rule 9 request uh, to Fujitsu on the 11th of March uh, of this year for a corporate statement relating to Phase 2 of the inquiry. Are you aware of that? I am, yes. Uh, and you were chosen by Fujitsu to be one of several witnesses who we've heard from uh, to respond to that request. Yes. Um, now, in that original Rule 9 request, there was a section about robustness. Do you remember that? I do, yes. Yes, and it asked for an explanation as to what was known by ICL <coughs> about the accuracy and integrity of the data recorded and processed on the Horizon system. Yes. It also asked about... Uh, the extent to which deficiencies in the Horizon IT system were capable of causing or caused apparent discrepancies or shortfalls. Do you remember that? I do. Um, after you gave a draft statement, you were sent a second request asking for more detail in certain respects. Do you remember that? I do. Uh, that request was the 1st of July of this year. Again, in that request, there was a broad question about robustness. Do you remember that? I do. You may not remember, but in that request at the top, there was a, a section in capital letters uh, saying that you're expected to have refreshed your memory uh, from contemporaneous documents. Do you remember that section? I do. Well, uh, let's look at your statement. It, it begins with an introduction. Uh, could we scroll onto the next page, please? It then has a background section, and, and over the page, it goes on to talk about the bid 
uh, for the Horizon project. And over the page, this is paragraph 12. Uh, and, and there you say uh, that there are a number of decisions before you came onto the scene, uh, one of which was the ISDN decision to, to use ISDN, and the second was uh, to use Riposte. Is that a fair summary of that, that paragraph? Yes, it is. Um, they were two big decisions that are mentioned in, your paragraph, in that paragraph. Um, you've said a number of decisions, but presumably you see those as the two significant decisions that were taken before your time. Yes, those were two main ones. There's a few further ones as well. Uh, and the point that you make is that the decision to choose riposte uh, was not your decision. That's correct. Um, your initial role, I think, was to do performance modeling on Riposte. Is that right? Yes, on Riposte and the, the network, yeah. Um, can we look at paragraph 18 so we can scroll on a little bit more? Thank you very much. Um, at paragraph 18, you say, at this initial stage, I did have some concerns about whether Riposte whether the Riposte messaging solution would effectively scale to approximately 20,000 branches, as it had not been proven to work at that scale before. This was not a concern that was unique to me, but was a known issue that was actively discussed within the bid team and ISHA. Um, looking at paragraph 19, you say, I'm just going to turn to my own copy, um, managing the scale, scaling of Riposte uh, was not within my responsibility. However, I do recall from my general involvement on the architecture team that this concern was eventually addressed in the deployment phase during and prior to pilots and rollout of Horizon. So again, what you're making clear there is that that wasn't your responsibility, the scaling of Riposte, um, but it was addressed. Y yes, I was very much aware of that. Can we look at paragraph 21, please? Um, in that paragraph, you set out the approach that had been taken to Riposte and how it had been decided um, that it would operate. So again, again, it's, it's emphasizing there that that wasn't your decision as to how to operate to Riposte, is that? That's correct. Correct. Um, and paragraph 22, please. You say that you didn't have any concerns about the use of Riposte in that manner. So again, it wasn't your decision how to use it, but you didn't have any concerns about uh, its use in the manner in which it was used. Is that? That's correct. Correct. Can we look at paragraph 24 and 25, please? Uh, 24, uh, in order for this design to function on the Horizon system, Escher needed to develop new software to use in Riposte. So 24 and 25, I think, explain the new software that needed to be developed. Uh, and then scrolling over to 26. It says there that you worked on the ISDN network solution. So that was the focus of your work there. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, can we look over the page to paragraph 27? Uh, and you say, in respect of the ISDN work that you carried out, the bid team internally convinced ourselves that the ISDN solution was sufficient. Yes. So, sorry. Sorry. Uh, yes, that, that's correct. It took a while to, get, to come to that conclusion. Yes. Um, so that's the area that, that you say you were responsible for, the ISDN connection, uh, and you were ultimately convinced that it was sufficient. Is that right? Yes. Um, paragraph 29, please. Uh, and onwards, address the initial go live pilot. I think you highlight in that paragraph, or in paragraph 31, uh, that the initial go live was limited from your perspective because it had a permanent ISDN connection. Um, so it didn't test the more intermittent ISDN connection. Yeah, yes. Um, but 32, so scrolling down, 
Um, you didn't recollect any specific problems um, that arose during that initial go live phase, is that right? Uh, yes, not within my area, which was the network area. Yes. Um, over the page to the 200 to 300 branch pilots, again, you say there in paragraph 34 you don't recall any problems occurring. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. In, in my area, which was the network at that stage. And then 35 onwards addresses the pilot and the rollout of new release 2. Uh, a paragraph 38, please. You observed during the pilot, we observed a number of issues as you worked towards scaling the Horizon solution. And you set out there three issues. I think A could be summarized as moving some external storage. Is that right? Uh, y yes, it is. Uh, B is providing a VSAT to remote branches. So instead of the ISDN, certain branches could use a satellite connection. Yes, so that was dealing with the fact that I ISDN, although it's the primary network technology, wasn't available everywhere. So it needed to be an alternative solution. Uh, and C, if we could keep on scrolling to C, uh, soft software updates needed to be scheduled differently because they were all taking place at the same time, causing some difficulty. Yes. Right. And then we go to paragraph 40, please where you say, beyond the points above, I do not recall the issues that arose during the NR2 pilot. However, I believe they were typical of any large IT projects of the time. You don't recall any particular issues that contributed to the delay of the NR2 pilot or the rollout of the system. Um, it's paragraph 46, then, that addresses the issue of robustness. And I'm going to read that paragraph. Um, it says, I'm aware of the inquiry's definition of robustness. I'm only able to evaluate the horizon system's robustness from the perspective of my roles on networking and security. And I note that I had a much more limited involvement in relation to Horizon Online than its predecessor. Just to be clear, there is a section in your statement on Horizon Online that I've skipped over. Yeah. Um, it was also not my role to design or develop the applications that would have recorded slash processed data on Horizon, including in relation to branch accounts. From that perspective, I did not have concerns about the robustness of Horizon, nor was I aware of any. Uh, can I just clarify, um, was there another Mark Jarosz working at ICL in 2000, 2001, or it's a pretty unique name Presumably, you were the only, um, uh, only one, yes. Um, you've been given some papers over the past few days, um, many of which with your name on, uh, which relate to um, repost bugs, uh, what's known as repost lock, commonly referred to re repost lock, um, and that uh, is known to have fed into what we know as the calendar square bug. Um, which paragraph of your statement do we find mention of, of the repost lock issues? So in, in terms of the uh, repost lock issues, the, the reason I was involved in that was because the uh, people working on the problem needed to find out from Escher what the error messages went, meant. And at the time, there were very few of us who had a kind of a, a working relationship with Escher. So my role was to ask questions directly face-to-face -face with uh, Andrew Sutherland from Escher about what that meant and convey his response to the people working on the problem in uh, ICL at the time. Yes, uh, and where in your statement can, can you find reference to the repost lock problem with Horizon? I, I didn't mention the uh, repost lock problem in my statement. Did you follow the group litigation, the Bates and others case? Did you follow that at all? In, in the press, as it was reported, yes. So, I mean, you still work for Fujitsu, so presumably it's quite well known. Yes. Um, did you presumably understand the significance of those repost lock events in the context of that case? No, sorry, I, I, I didn't. Did you follow the, the calendar square 
incident at all. No, I, sorry, no. I didn't. Um, I'm going to take you to the documents in, in a moment, but it looks from those documents as though you were quite a central figure in, in trying to resolve or deal with Isha in relation to that repost lock problem. Is I, that a fair description of your role? Well, well I was working with Isha at the time on the uh, networking aspects of repost, which meant I spent time in their facilities in, uh, in Boston, USA. And when people working on such issues had questions of them, then the, because there wasn't much documentation, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, about the repost, pro the messaging product, the way the questions were resolved was to ask them directly, face to face. And whilst it was the case that during the uh, bid phase, Asher did attend uh, ICL offices in Felton. At that stage, they were mainly in, the, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So my role was to convey those questions directly to Esher and get responses and feed those back. So, so you were being given problems by engineers working on particular problems, and your role was the direct liaison with Escher in relation to those problems? Yes. There were other people, not just me, involved in the liaison, but not many, and I was one of them. Yes. Um, I mean, it's fair to say from that that you, you were, were fairly involved in trying to resolve Escher-related bugs in that case, weren't you? Well, as, as one of the examples shows, my role was to convey the the information back to our team so they could progress with what they're doing. In many cases, the information I provided was not sufficient for them to resolve the bug, but allow them to progress with it. So is your evidence that you were simply the liaison with Asher? In, in that particular example. Of, um, our and you weren't making decisions. I mean, similar to the other parts of your evidence where you say, Decisions were taken, and I was simply following them. Is that the position in relation to repost lock? In, in, in the example that you gave, repost lock, that was the case. There are other examples, uh, which are also in the pack, where I was asked by the architecture group to take more of a proactive role. But in repost lock, you didn't take a no. proactive role? No. And, and there are other bugs that you did take a proactive role in relation to? Yes. And where are those mentioned in your witness statement? Um, so the, the example wasn't a repose bug, and, and I didn't mention it in my witness statement. This is, a, I think it's a E1. It, it was called the, the handle leak problem. Uh, we'll look at the handle leak okay. problem as a background. Um, can I just ask, while we're on this issue, we, we can take down the witness statement. Thank you. Um, what was your relationship with Gareth Jenkins at this particular time? So, I, I would describe it as professional, um, uh, based on uh, the, the need to work together, because we were part of the, at the time, Alan Ward's team. So, Gareth, would, when Gareth was aware, for example, that I was going to visit Escher, he, he may ask me some questions um, to Were convey you to them. senior to him, at the same level? Uh, same level. We worked in, we had different responsibilities within the architecture team, so I mean, it, it looks, level. We'll go to the correspondence in due course, but it looks from some of that correspondence that he's looking to you for guidance. W would you accept that? No, I, because he was a, a peer working in a different part of the solution. So whilst I was responsible for the networking part of the solution, he was responsible for the, uh, the, the, the counter and agent applications. Um, would you say you had joint responsibility then for certain issues? Um, well, I can imagine that could, could arise, yes, where 
there was an issue where it wasn't clear where, where the issue lay. With something like the repost lock problem, would you have joint responsibility for that? Well, no, because in, in that particular example, what Gareth wanted to know from Escher was what that error message went, meant. The, the, the repost product uh, logged lots of error messages, and there was no documentation which said what, to, what this error message means and what the consequences could be. So he needed someone to ask that question. And in, in, in some cases, he, would, he asked me. In other cases, he would have asked the liaison that was uh, at Escher, uh, because we had people who were there kind of on secondment to act in that liaison role. So again, you were the conduit rather than the person who was responsible? Yes, one, one of them, yeah. Um, were you ever asked to give statements in criminal proceedings? No. Um, were you ever involved in who would give such a statement? No. As peers, why was Gareth Jenkins selected and, and you weren't? Do you know? I, I, I don't have knowledge of why that was. Um, were you ever involved in researching historic issues with riposts more recently, for example? No. Um, I, I'm going to take you to a document, it's poll 00028911. Uh, this is a document that we may well come back to, and it's, I don't think it's necessarily a document you've seen. Is, is it a document that you are familiar with at all? No, I, I don't recognize the document. Um, so the only relevance for, for the current purposes are that it relates, it, it concerns the calendar square uh, bug. And if you look at the list of peaks, uh, it says that it lists the peaks that are related to that issue, and one of them is PC 00056922, and that's something that we're going to come back to in due course. So we can take that document down um, for now, but we will look at that particular peak. Uh, let's look at the contemporaneous documents from 2000, 2001. Can we look at FUJ 00078274, please? Um, so this is, is going to be a bit of background before we get to the particular peak. Uh, this is an ICL weekly progress report for the 30th of July 2000 to the 2nd of August 2000. Can we look at page three, please? So this is a document you're familiar with, and I think you've already referred to one of the issues that's raised there, and let's have a look at those. Um, can we scroll down that page, please? Um, a, a little bit more so that we've got the whole of that 1.2 in view, please. Um, so here there are two major critical issues arising during the week. The first handles leaks in the repost messaging server, uh, which could ultimately threaten rollout if not resolved. And it says an urgent fix is being sought from Escher. Is it, that, it, that's the one you referred to just a moment ago, is it? Yeah, yes, it is. And again, that, that one isn't mentioned in your statement, is it? No, no, it isn't. No. But. And can you very briefly explain what, what that relates to, leaks in the repost message mm, server? Yes. So during, uh, I, I believe during testing, it was observed that some resources used by the repost message server were increasing. And the testers were concerned that um, that behavior uh, suggested there was a, a leak in the repost message server. What is that, a leak? Does that mean? Uh, it, it, it means that it's using resources in a manner that eventually will run out of the resources and stop working. So that was the conclu in interim conclusion reached by test. And Therefore, it raised quite a few concerns. So my role uh, was to uh, initially, uh, this was agreed within the architecture team, was to uh, describe the scenario to Escher and ask them whether this was a, a bug or behavior as designed. And they confirmed it was behavior, Andrew Sutherland confirmed this was behavior as designed. So within the architecture group, we then decided to see 
and, and by the way, Andrew Sutherland also explained to me why this was happening and when it would stop. Can you just ask, who's Andrew Sutherland? He, he's the uh, uh, chief architect for the Escher Group messaging product. So he's the kind of uh, person who knows about the product the most. Would he be your direct liaison with the Escher Group? Yes. Uh, there's a second problem that's mentioned there. The second problem is the failure to swap out slave counters on... Now, we've seen this before. Is it CI4, is it? Is that something you remember, or is it CL4, C14? I think it's CI4, CI4. but I, I, just rem I'm, I remember it as being one of the releases that we were doing. Yes. Uh, and it says, at present, intermittent fault causes the repost service to hang, uh, and it continues investigations of slave swaps has shown the problem occurring at a number of different points in the process of copying squirreled message store, uh, etc. Uh, is, is, can you briefly explain what that issue was at all? No, I wasn't involved in that, so I, I wasn't asked to help with that issue. Is this a document that you would have seen at the time, though? Um, ICL Weekly Progress Report. Well, I, I may have received it on an email, but I can't remember reading it. I mean, do you remember receiving Pathway Weekly Progress Reports in, in 2000? I, I, I do recall being copied of them, yes. Would it not have been of interest to you? Um, so, y yes, I would be, be interested if there were network issues. And in, in the issue that, the, the, the handle leak issue, it was called to my attention because I was involved in dealing with it. Are you able to assist us with what it means by um, intermittent fault causes the repost service to hang? Is that a lock issue, or is that something else? Um, I, can, I can speculate what that means um, in, in general terms. The, because if repose is hanging, I, I would assume it means it's unresponsive and can't be used for anything and needs to be restarted. Can we look at page six, please? And at the bottom, there's a section on current critical problems. Uh, and there are the two problems there that we've just discussed. Uh, the first is getting the squirreled message store. Um, they can't successfully swap out a faulty counter on CI4. And then the second one is the issue in live with handle leak. Uh, and it says there, Gareth Jenkins will address this issue. In the meantime, Mark Jarosh will liaise with Escher to establish the root cause of the leak. Yes. So, so just confirm, that's exactly what I did. I liaised with Escher, and I fed back my findings to the t internally within ICL. As a resu result of that, because Repose was working as designed based on the feedback, the uh, decision was made to uh, attempt to reproduce the problem or reproduce the scenario in our test facility in Bracknell, where we had a, a, the ability to simulate thousands of counters connecting to correspondence servers. And that proved that this was not an issue. Um, now, as I said, this is, I'm taking this for background and to establish the roles and responsibilities. Yes. Um, it seems as though Gareth Jenkins and yourself are the prime uh, principal contacts with regards to riposte errors at that stage. Is that right? Um, so Gareth Jenkins' role in this was based on the assumption that this is an issue that needs to be addressed and how we would mitigate that in the live solution. My role with the performance team was to find out if we needed a fix from Escher or whether this was working as designed. I mean, what you're doing, you're not just kind of passing messages to Escher, though, are you? You're described here as establishing the root cause of the leak or, or working with Escher to establish the root cause. Yes, but in this particular example, it, 
a very brief conversation with Andrew Sutherland confirmed that there was no problem. So the, the assertion there was a leak was incorrect. And in order to test that, we, that's why we ran it on the, the, this test facility we had in Bracknell to confirm all was, there was no problem. Absolutely. I, I'm not concerned with the particular issue that occurred here. Um, I, I'm more concerned about the different roles and responsibilities. Okay. Uh, and certainly reading here, you're acting as more than just simply a messenger with Escher. Uh, you're the person who's liaising with them in order to find out the root cause of the problem. Yeah, that's, that's very true, yes. yes. Uh, and was that typical of your job? Um. I, I can only recall a few issues I was asked to look at which are of this significance to the programme, and this is one of them. So, no, it wasn't typical. My, my normal day job was the uh, evolution of the network, which also include uh, changes to repost to work over the network. But would it be typical for Gareth Jenkins to be working on the technical side of something uh, and for him to ask you to liaise with Escher to try and resolve it? Well, it, there are examples where he, he's done that, yes, but typically by email. Be, be, uh, but the, uh, what he asked me to do was to ask specific information of Escher. And typically that would have been, there's some uh, observations made based on error messages. What do they mean? If that was not already known to him. Um, typically to establish the root cause of a problem. Yes, part of the problem investigation. Can we look at FUJ 00083544, please? Thank you very much. Uh, now, this is the pinnacle that uh, I mentioned earlier and that was mentioned in that calendar square document. Um, the pinnacle itself is at the bottom. It's been forwarded, uh, and it is pinnacle 56922. Can you see that? in the title, in the subject at the bottom. I can, yeah. Thank you. Can we go over the page to page two, please? I'm going to take some time over this document. Um, can we scroll down slightly on this page? There is an entry at 19.15 p.m. on the 1st of November. Um, yes, it, it's two, three, fourth entry there. And it says, PM, that's postmaster, uh, reports error message when trying to redeclare her cash. Thank you. And it says, there's another entry there, guided caller through redeclaration. STK, do, do, you, do you understand what it's saying there, just that, that entry? STK bal slash DEC. Cash. Um, DEC maybe December, perhaps. I don't know. It may not be. I'm not 100% sure what, it, what the abbreviations mean, whether it's referring to the navigation on this counter. I... Uh, the error message says, error committing declarations. Voice call to Dave in SMC. Uh, SMC? So I think that's one of our support teams. Yes. Uh, who requested I pass the call over to them, caller advised, and ref number given. And then it says user ADA001 advises that when an ASU, in brackets, cash declaration is made, the declaration would not be accepted. Search Kel for error committing nothing. Searched events from web page for counter one. An unexpected error occurred. Uh, I think that means to say while attempting to modify an entry in the run map, timeout error occurred waiting for lock, and also critical error number, it gives an error number, etc. cetera. Um, the repost put object function call returned an error, this happened while, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we go down the page, and it shows that at 22.16, so that's 
the near the bottom of the page there, repeat call. Postmaster is still waiting for a phone call. It's been three hours since this issue arose. Please ring immediately. The postmaster is only still available due to living on the property. Can we go over the page, please? Um, the first substantive entry there is the 2nd of November, still 924. Um, as PM Postmaster is trying to redeclare cash to alter, she's getting error in declaration of cash declaration, error in committing list. PM tried to create a new declaration for the difference and got the same message. Um, do, do you understand that at all? It, well, in general terms, I understand that these are operations being performed on the counter, yes. Is this an example, I, I don't know, of a postmaster trying to re-enter a, a, a declaration because of the problem that they, they are experiencing? It's, it's hard for me to say because I'm not familiar with the counter application and how it's used. Okay, uh, let, let's move down, please. Um, and it says there, um, it's the entry about halfway down the page, or three quarters of the way down. The above, Kale outlines the problem, HSH1 information, called Postmaster on the advice of SARA in SMC to get the messages Postmaster is getting. Postmaster would like a call back as it's now trading manually and is not being called back to get the problem solved. Uh, so it looks as though the postmaster there has stopped using Horizon and, and is trading manually. Do you agree with that interpretation? Yes. Yes. Uh, and then slightly below 9.38, um, if we could scroll down a little bit, um, it says the call summary has changed from PM reports error message when trying to redeclare uh, and it's now error committing declarations. Is that something you understand at all? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Um, can we go over the page, please? There's an entry at 9.40 on the next page. And it says there, this call has been raised to A, uh, as post off office is manual due to being unable to roll over SU, due to the events being generated by Gateway, uh, which SSC are actioning as per KEL. It's, it's effectively been given an A priority. Uh, Mike Wolgar rang in. I explained the situation, and he requested that he be paged again if the situation is not resolved by 1 o'clock. Um, can we go down to 10.30, please? seems there, NBSC chasing, it's a priority call. NBSC say Postmaster is on manual. Uh, Postmaster was called this morning by second line and told nonsense. PM is very angry and feels she is being messed about. Contacted EDSC, who states that haven't called PM, called SMC, is checking with the person who was dealing, whether they called. Postmaster will call back. MBSC says it will call back in 20 minutes if no resolution. Um, were you at that time familiar with these kinds of concerns from postmasters? No. Um, 10.36, the entry there says, if NBSC ring back on this, uh, call please uh, contact an STSA, has given 20 minute deadline in which she is calling us back. Um, 10.46, slightly further down the page. Spoke to Les, passing over urgently. Advise, advised user to reboot as she was stuck in a loop and contact NBSC as to extending cash accounting period. Message store and event log audit logs coming. Um, now, were you aware or are you now aware uh, that a workaround in relation to this problem was rebooting? Uh, 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm now aware that it's been mentioned, um, but the... Do, do you remember your state of knowledge about the uh, repost lock issue uh, and whether a workaround was, at that time, to reboot? No, and that wasn't the advice that was given, uh, that I recall from Andrew Sutherland either. But you would accept that that is the advice that's being given in this particular pinnacle? Advised user to reboot as she was stuck in a loop? Yes, I mean, it's, it's very clear, yes. Um, can we go over the page, please? Um, and it's about halfway down the page, 1122. It says, the call record has been transferred to the team EPOS-FP. Who, who were EPOS-FP? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know who that team are. Um, I'm not sure what FP stands for. If we go down um, to the entry after, so 1148, the call record has been transferred to the team EPOS Dev. Is that your team? No. What, what team is that? Well, given that EPOS is a counter, well, it's an application, it, I guess it's an applications team that look after. There were many applications in Horizon, and EPOS was one of them. So I would assume it's the team who looked after the EPOS application. Could we go to the next page, please, page six? And there's an entry by Martin McConnell. Who was Martin McConnell? I don't recognize that name. Okay. He says, in my first analysis of this message store supplied, it would appear that the declarations being written away were done so at the time that the EOD process kicked in, the message which indicates the repost failure, and it um, has, says their put persistent object, uh, should have allowed the user at least to have backed out and started again, which seems to happen satisfactorily when these conditions are simulated on a development system. As Les has indicated earlier, a system restart should be sufficient to get them back and working. Okay, in which case, I would suspect this call should be dropped to a B, We'll see if I can simulate the failure whilst in the midst of an EOD scenario. Um, so is Mr. McConnell there? Is, is a, an interpreta a fair interpretation of that, um, that he is going to try and simulate what the problem was? Is that a, a, a typical response? Yes, that's my reading of, of, of it. Um, we see there there's a customer call again. Um, paged Mike again as per his last request, has gone 3 p.m. and call still not resolved, awaiting his call back to advise. Customer call. Mike called to advise that if call not resolved by 6 p.m., then to page the duty manager again, call updated as requested. Uh, and then th it's the next entry that is really the significant entry on this pinnacle that I want to ask you about. Uh, Mr. McConnell says, I've talked to Brian Orzel. Who is Brian Orzel? So Brian Orzel was one of our developers, and he's also the person who spent quite a bit of time in uh, Azure facilities in the States in, in a kind of technical liaison role as well. Um, spoken to him about the lock errors written away by repost, and it would appear that this is an indication of repost being rather sick. Is that is that a technical term? What would you understand by sick? I'm not sure how to interpret that. There's many possible interpretations. There are several DIIs. What, what are DIIs? Uh, I think um, that's referring to D DLL. DLLs. Which is, uh, so where that, so DLL and executable are uh, computer code. So there are several DLLs and executables all being told to go away because of this locking problem. Either some application has left uh, some write lock on inadvertently or a post is sick as described. Again, sick, does that assist you at all? Again, it's hard for me to interpret what that means, but... Uh... 
a, a reboot should sort this out or try redeclaring on an alternative system. Brian Orzel has suggested rooting this for the attention of Mark Jarosch. Um, what do you have to say about the suggestion that it should be for your attention to deal with that issue? So, I, I assume from that that Brian wants me to find out from Escher what the right course of action is for this particular error message. Um, what I can't tell from the date was whether Brian was already out there or not on site with Escher. Um, can we look at the first page of this document, please? And at the bottom of the first page. Um, this pinnacle seems to have been sent to Gareth Jenkins on the 3rd of November. Um, what was Gareth Jenkins' role here? So within the, the team, G Gareth was the uh, Repost Technical Design Authority. And if we look at the top email, please. Um, Gareth Jenkins is emailing you, presumably following up from Mr. Orzel's comment. And he says there, I don't know if you've been phoned about this one. It seems to have been passed to you on the Isha Dev stack. What was the Isha Dev stack? So within Pinnacle, there's multiple group groupings for different people. And I think Isha Dev is one of those groupings. It refers there to what the problem is, including the message timeout occurred waiting for lock. Um, he says, I assume the problem is down to the previous query from EPOS. However, I can't see why that would cause a one-off problem in the system. Um, I don't know if it is relevant, but the machine appears to have been rebooted in the middle of the night a couple of days earlier, i.e. at 2 o'clock and twice at 3 on the 30th of October. The counter appears to be CI4. Now, we, we, we've mentioned that earlier. Um, we have previously in this inquiry seen an email from Gareth Jenkins, uh, oh, sorry, to Gareth Jenkins, where Gareth Jenkins is copied in about CI4. Uh, and that email um, ex expressed concerns regarding counter performance and code regression with CI4. Is that something you remember at all? No. Um, what is Gareth Jenkins asking you to do here? So I, th well, I think the, the first thing that he's asking is for and confirming with Escher if this has not already been done previously, what error 82 means and what the consequences are. Um, presumably, you, you would have read the pinnacle that was forwarded to you. So at the bottom of this email, he's forwarding the full message to you. Would you have read that at the time? I, I would I would expect to, yes. I can't remember that particular email, but in general, yes. I mean, th those comments about Riposte being rather sick, um, that message went to you at least, didn't it? Yes, it did. Um, and we started today, the first document we looked at, or the second document we looked at, was um, about problems earlier that year with Riposte, and you mentioned um, one of them was resolved. Uh, but there were two critical issues with riposte that were mentioned in that earlier document that I took you to. Um, was this building on your knowledge of issues with riposte at all? So I think in the first part of the question is about the error message. And what I cannot recollect is whether I I've asked this question about should be before or not, or whether it had to be asked 
for the first time about what that error message actually means. So I think that's certainly one thing that's being asked in the email. Uh, would you have been concerned to have received a pinnacle that said that uh, Riposte was sick? Well, in, in general, yes. And it, it, I think the, the, the pinnacle, uh, I mean, in general, with problems like this, unless the error message explains the problem, there is a need to reproduce the problem. So if that's indeed what happened, then that would be the right course of action. Was it something that you think should have had Escher's urgent attention? Y yes, mo most definitely, based on the uh, priority, yes. Can we look at FUJ00083548, please? Now, on the second page, we see the pinnacle. Uh, it starts on the very bottom of the first page, but it, it's the second page, uh, and it's a pinnacle that is from the 9th of November, so just a, a, a week later. Uh, the reference here for this pinnacle is PC0057478. Um, and we see on the second page, about halfway down, the entry at 2155. Uh, it says, a critical error was registered. An error occurred while attempting to destroy a checkpoint run. Timeout occurred waiting for lock. Uh, no suitable KEL. Uh, are you able to help us with that at all? It, it's not listed on that document that I showed you um, the first document that I showed you to identifying the relevant pinnacles or peaks for uh, the calendar square problem, but is that also uh, a riposte lock issue that's being reported there? Yes, it is. So the this is another example where there's an error message reported by riposte, and the whilst I don't recollect this particular example, what I would have done in general is I would have taken this to Escher and asked them for uh, feedback about what the, what the error means, what the consequences are on the, on, on the message store, and what the right course of action would be. Would you have taken them to Escher on every occasion? Only, only when asked, because I wasn't the only person who was liaising with Escher. So if I was, if I was asked either by email or verbally to follow up, then I would do that. I would, I would take the opportunity whilst I was out there to do that. So, so every occasion you're asked, you, you would go to Escher and try and resolve the issue? Well, I would certainly take the issue to Escher and, and feed back on the question I was asked. It wasn't always possible in a timely manner because sometimes when I was working there, the people who I needed to ask weren't there. Um, can, can we look at the first page, please? If we look at the top, it, uh, well, at the bottom, it seems again to be a pinnacle that went to Gareth Jenkins on the 20th of November in this case. Um, and he emails you at the top on the 21st of November. They're American uh, date formats, but I'm, I'm confident that that is the 21st of November. Um, why would Gareth Jenkins have emailed you on this occasion? Because he wants Escher to confirm details of what error 94 means. Um, can you just ha have a look at this document and tell us in simple terms what, what's going on? Um, so in, in the third paragraph, starting however I am curious, He's asking, uh, he's quoting some error messages that were logged by Repost. And he's then stating he assumes they've been lying, but would appreciate confirmation fr from myself before closing the pinnacle. And the only way I can seek that confirmation is to ask Escher. I mean, assuming it is benign, that, that's something that we'll see again. Is that a, a, an assumption that something 
um, is going to be okay, but it's not a definitive um, position. Well, the it's probably building on so understanding what the error message means is part of analyzing the possible problem it could cause and i think only on conclusion once that analysis is complete uh, it could be concluded maybe that these messages can be ignored however i would say in general that if it's an error message it does need to be analyzed. Um, so again, it's a pinnacle, the detail of which is being sent to you by Gareth Jenkins uh, for you to take up with Riposte, is it? So my, so my response to this email would be to ask uh, Esha for details of the error message, under what circumstances it occurs, um, and what the consequences are, and then feed that back to Gareth either verbally, face-to-face, uh, -face, or via email, whichever. And you'll do that in every case when you're asked to? Um, well, it, it, where is the very specific question, what, what, what is this error message? Yes, I, I would. Um, but it, if I wasn't able to have that conversation with Andrew Sutherland, then it may be quite a few weeks before there's any response. And that final substantive paragraph uh, talks about ClearDesk. Now, I think ClearDesk was um, a, a way of resolving this uh, repost lock issue because ClearDesk, I think, um, re effectively restarted the system. Is that? Do, do you remember that at all? I, I recognise the term ClearDesk, but I wasn't really aware of the counter architecture and what processes ran when on the counter. Um, Gareth Jenkins says that each time it's put out um, as part of the ClearDesk closedown function, ClearDesk continues okay, so again, it isn't serious, but we need to avoid any errors being generated at the counter as part of ClearDesk, since they cost Pathway 3P each for a phone call. You, can you tell us about that, please? Yes. So, at this time, the... Um the networking was the, the ISDN dial-on-demand network. And the, what that meant was that uh, there, was no, there was no connection uh, between the uh, counter and data center normally. But when there was a need for communication, this ISDN phone call would be established. And what um, Gareth is asserting there is that if an one of the conditions for actually forwarding messages to the data center, in this case, it was a Tivoli function. If there's a red or an error event logged by anything on the counter, then Tivoli will forward that to the data center for investigation. And that is the phone call that's being referred to. So is that him saying we'd rather not spend the money on the phone calls? Um, Well, given that there were quite a lot of phone calls going on anyway, I'm not sure um, he's directly concerned about the cost of a phone call because, I mean, what I would say is that there may well be other reasons why there's a call made anyway at that time. If we look at the very final sentence there, he says, um, assign the pinnacle to me on Escher Dev until I get feedback from you both. Um, now, I asked you about Escher Dev before. Does this assist your memory? Is Gareth Jenkins part of that Escher Dev team? So within, within um, Pinnacle, there's multiple groups. And by implication, Gareth is part of that Escher Dev team because he's just a, what he said, yes. Yeah. Um, can we look at FUJ00083568, please? This is an email to you a few days later, 24th of November, 2000. And can we look over the page, please? Page two. Um, 
in fact, actually, I think we can stay with page one. Uh, the pinnacle there, the reference is PC0057957. And that is dated the 16th of November. Uh, but it relates to the first pinnacle that I took you to, ending 56922. Um, and it says that at the very top of the first page, it says this pinnacle is related to that pinnacle, which is the one that's linked to later linked to Calendar Square. Uh, can we look? please over the page to page two. Again, it refers to a critical event was registered and it says timeout occurred waiting for lock. So again, that seems as though it's one of those riposte lock issues. Yes. Can we go to page three, please? 23rd of November, 1110. This event was reported in PC 0056922. Uh, this call has been closed, but the comments from Mark Jarosh were that if calls of this nature were over one per, per month, then further investigation should be carried out. In this case, I presume that archiving was processing and there was still an outstanding lock on the run table. I presume that the reload of repost at clear desk will release the locks. Investigating frequency of events uh, in the estate. Now, the suggestion there is that it wasn't on every occasion that you were asked that you would investigate. You would uh, apply some sort of minimum threshold of a problem before uh, going to repost. So, in the example of the error message, then it's very clear that because within Pathway, we didn't know what, the, we had no documentation to tell us what the error message went, meant. We had to ask Azure what it meant. But if you received a one-off incident, or what you considered to be a one-off incident, would you go to Azure? If Gareth asked me to, yes, I would. Um, so the suggestion there that really they need to be looking out for a more common occurrence, where would they have got that idea from? So I think in, in, in one of the examples, uh, where we discussed reproducing the problem, then the that's when we talked about the frequency of it occurring. Uh, and we'll talk about reproducing in a moment, because it seems as though you had concerns that if something couldn't be reproduced, there wasn't really any point in going to Escher. Is that right? Well, it's, it's more a case of if we need to go to Azure because we've found a bug in repost, and th this occurs, this is a more general statement, if we, if we need to investigate a bug, then we, we are very keen to reproduce it so that we can then in, both investigate it with a vendor and also confirm the fix has worked. Um, sticking with this particular issue, can we go down slightly to the next substantive entry? It says, this event has some 129 counters reporting this, and also MBOCOR02 and MBOCOR03 has reported this event. Although it may be expected on the core servers, is that corresponding servers? I think it is, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think this needs investigating. Please state what evidence is required. We'll attach event log, message store, and audit logs for this outlet. Uh, and then if we look down a little further, it says that it's 1317. Uh, the call record has been assigned to the team member, Gareth Jenkins. Um, and then if we look at the first page, it's Gareth Jenkins emailing you. So again, he's emailed you with the full detail of that pinnacle. Um, would you have received, would you have read that pinnacle at the time? I, I can't re recall reading it, that particular one, but I, w in general, would try to keep up with the emails, yes. Uh, so the message, for example, that the event has some 129 counters reporting, um, that was sent to you, and typically you would read those messages that were sent to you. Yes. Um, 
Now it says at the bottom there, I've assigned the pinnacle to you on Escher Dev. A again, so does, does that assist you with Escher Dev? I'm, I'm aware what Escher Dev is with the yes. pinnacle, yes. Um, so you were being assigned because you were part of that team? Well, I think it was assigned to me because in terms of it, the next step in that pinnacle, what Gareth was asking for was a definitive statement from Drew on, on that error message. So the next stage in that, the workflow for that pinnacle would be to update it with that statement. And Drew is? So a Andrew Sutherland, he's the uh, chief architect from Escher Group, the expert on the repost messaging product. Thank you. And um, Mr. Jenkins says, as the pinnacle says, uh, this seems to be happening fairly frequently. As far as I can tell, the application is carrying on OK in this case. Since the failure is at midnight, then repost is likely to be reloaded fairly soon. I think we, could, uh, we do need a definitive statement from Drew as to whether this event is benign or what problems we could have when it happens. Could it be due to an application error? Do we need to get more info on when these problems occur? It is clear that the circumstances in this case are very different from those in the original pinnacle. Now, Mr. Jenkins there seems to be concerned about repeated errors and where they come from. Do you agree with that? Oh, most definitely, yes. Um, and he, he says that he, he doesn't seem sure that it's benign by that stage. Well, until we get, we need the feedback from Escher to explain the error message, uh, which I think we actually got maybe in this example. I don't know if there's an email from me with the feedback from Escher. Well, we, we, we'll come to, okay, to an you. email from you. Um, you're being sent that by Gareth Jenkins again to take forward with Escher, to take forward with Drew, to see if it's benign or not. Yes, although I wouldn't actually ask Drew if it's benign or not, just ask him to explain it and what, what the consequences are. Can we look at FUJ00083574, please? This is an email from you to Gareth Jenkins. Um, it is about the same pinnacle, ending 957. Uh, and you say there, um, Gareth, from your description, it sounds as though we potentially have a recipe for a reproducible case. I will try this today and also in parallel chase Drew for a response on what this event means and whether we should be concerned. Um, uh, the reference there to reproducible case. Um, yes. Again, I, I think we discussed this briefly, but it's something that does crop up from time to time. And it looks like uh, what is being said is that without a reproducible case, it, it's difficult to progress the problem. Is that something you agree with or, or not? Oh, it, yes, it's much more difficult to progress a problem that we can't reproduce, yes, unless it's a, a previously known issue. Um, and it looks from this and, and other correspondence that you do at least apply some criteria in, in respect of following things up with Escher. Um, in fact, in this case, you say you are going to. Um, but if it wasn't a reproducible case, if it seemed like a one-off issue, would you always send it to Escher? Y yes, most definitely. The, the, the reason for uh, mentioning the potentially reproducible case is... Um, that it makes the interaction with Escher potentially much more productive, because as well as asking them what could happen, we can actually demonstrate what is happening. And can we go to FUJ00083582, please? This is now the 1st of December of 2000, and this is, is this an update to Gareth Jenkins on this issue? So this, in this case, I respond... I've responded to his question about the particular error message and what the feedback I had from Drew was. And As, sorry. sorry. You say that, hi, Gareth, I can confirm, having checked with Drew, that a timeout of this sort is likely to be benign in the sense that it should not result in a message store corruption. 
Um, however, had the operation which was affected by this timeout been a message server internal operation, for example, an index maintenance thread operation, then an additional error should have been logged. Uh, therefore, a possibility is that an API call has timed out and the application is not checking for error events. Uh, now, that update, likely to be benign, should not result. Uh, possibly uh, an API call it has timed out, etc. cetera. Um, uh, would you accept that those are quite caveated responses? Yes, yes they are. Based on conversation with Asher and the limited information we have available, trying to say what could be happening. I mean, for, for example, Escher are making the point that if something was affected in the message server, there would have been further error messages. And as it's their product, they, they can say that's by design. Um, so even though I use the term sh should have been logged, I maybe should have said highly likely it would have been logged because Azure said so. But it looks from that message as though you haven't got to the bottom of the problem. Oh, that's, that is definitely the case, yes, because the, 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 the next part is very significant, and this again is based on conversations with Escher, that because there's an error message and something has timed out, then something, something was trying to happen, and if, if it wasn't an internal message server operation, because Escher said so, then the suggestion is that the uh, and, we, and we know there was an agent, because Gareth mentioned this, running at the time, then the agent may have caused, uh, an agent operation may have caused the error, which is why uh, the suggestion from Escher was check that the agent is validating all responses from interactions with a repose message server. So I'll, I'll come to that A and B in a second. Um, but the words, for example, mostly benign or relatively benign uh, are words that we've, we, we've seen elsewhere and we we'll, may see in further emails. Um, and again, likely, should, etc. cetera. Um, does that indicate, perhaps, that you couldn't be sure that there wouldn't be serious problems arising from this repost lock issue at that stage? Um, so I'm, I'm definitely not sure that is the case. And it, there is further investigation needed, yes. And then looking at those A and B, um, in terms of progressing, I would suggest, so this is you suggesting, not just pass, simply passing a message, but you're coming up with a, your own solution? No, th that was not the case. When I discussed this with Drew, and we made the observation that there were no other error messages from the message server, uh, he stated that as there was an agent running, then the agent possibly would have had error, error responses, which should have been logged, and po possibly they weren't, which is why the, uh, the, the recommendation uh, for A is directly as a consequence of what Drew asked me to. Is the agent checking all the responses correctly? But you weren't simply passing a message. You were applying your own mind to the issue as well, weren't you? So in the case of A, that, it was Drew's recommendation to check that the, the agent or the application used in the repost message server was checking its responses correctly. But I mean, let's look at it. A, a says, get the LFS agent code checked to confirm uh, that all API calls have error checking. I'm happy to do this if the developers are prepared to send me the source. Um, now, we've heard about issues accessing Escher code. Is that referring to an issue accessing the original code? Uh, no, this, the, the LFS agent code is R code. So, the rec so who are the developers that you're talking about there? Well, the development team who created the agent, I don't know who the individuals are. So you're saying there uh, that you're happy to assist if the ICL pathway developers are prepared to send you the code? Yes, I mean, I, 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 what I should have said, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek. I should have said they should check it themselves because they should be checking all replies. Were there issues internally with getting hold of source code? Um, no, the develop because these were internal people doing development, they would have the source code for their own, their own agent. So they, they could 
get, get this checked relatively easily. Um, and B, continue to try and reproduce the problem, knowing what the agent is doing, either source code or some design documentation would be useful. Um, so it seems there that a solution is to keep on trying to reproduce it. Um, so at that stage, it seems it hasn't been reproduced or is, is not yet reproducible. Yes. Just looking at the time. Um, so shall we t take a short break now? I mean, I probably only have 20 minutes left. Um, and then there will be some questions from recognized legal representatives. We can either take a break now or in 20 minutes. No, no let, let's do it now, because I think we have to think of the transcriber as well. Yes. Uh, so let's do it now. And during this short break, Mr. Jarosh, would you please not speak about your evidence with anyone? All right. Okay. Thank you. Should we say um, 25 past or half past? It's uh, quarter past. If, if the people in the room think that we'll complete the witness comfortably before lunch, I'm happy with half past. Uh, um, yes, I think the answer is yes. Right. Half past then. <laughs> Hello, Chair, we can see you. Can you see and hear us? Yes, that I can, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before the break, we the first documents I took you to, we saw um, early repost issues in the summer of 2000, and then I took you to some pinnacles uh, that were later in 2000 uh, that addressed things such as the repost lock. Um, can I take you to... Poll 00028911, please. Now, if you'd like to take some time over this document, please do. It's a document that we're not too sure uh, where it's come from. Um, it may have been written by Gareth Jenkins. Um, that may be established in due course. Um, it, it's a document that I took you to first today, and I showed you the PC005622 uh, uh, being referenced there. Um, can we scroll down this page, please? Um, and actually, over to the next page. I, over to the next page. Um, there's some analysis there, analysis of peaks. And it said um, they're all related to different incidents of the same fundamental error message in repost. And then how we dealt with the problem. It says, when first spotted in 2000, an avoidance action was identified. And this was identified in the CAL. The advice was for SMC to monitor the associated events and then alert branch. It isn't clear how effective this was. And then it says analysis of peaks quoted, uh, which of them truly refer to the same issue. Uh, they all relate to the same repost error. It isn't clear why this reoccurred in 2010 after repost fix in 2006. Uh, and then there's a section on scope. Um, it says the root cause of all these problems, of all these, was a bug in repost that had the effect of preventing a counter from writing messages, either those being replicated to it or was generated on that counter. This is not always immediately obvious to the user of the counter. This could result in them thinking that some transactions which had been entered were missing, and so they attempted to re-enter the transactions on another counter. Uh, when the offending counter was restarted, both versions of the transaction became visible, and this caused, uh, could cause errors in the accounts. Attempting to balance the branch uh, when a counter was in this state could also result in errors. Is that something that you remember? And I'm not talking about this particular document, but that kind of a summary of the problem. No, I've, I've never seen this before. It's the first time I've read right. it. But, but the issue, does that accurately describe for you uh, the repost lock problem or the consequences of the repost lock problem? Is 
so the, the first paragraph there about the root cause, the, yes. the analysis conducted, then I can see how that could be a con consequence of the repose lock problem. And um, given that someone's done that analysis, it, it makes sense to me, yes. And, and the reason I'm taking you to this document now is that it addresses some of the things that you said this morning. And I just want to turn over the page, please. There's some analysis of those pinnacles from 2000, and it's that first substantive paragraph, and I'm going to read it for the record. It says, however, on rereading peak PC 0126376, I can see it refers to two KELs, which I presumably didn't look at back in 2010, which were raised much earlier. This shows that the repost issue had been initially identified back in 2000. This is made clear in KEL J. Ballantyne, uh, 5245K and the associated peak PC0056922. This shows that there is a problem in repost such that if it loses a thread which holds a critical lock, then repost grinds to a halt and the counter becomes unstable. The avoidance action is to restart the computer. And just pausing there, do you remember uh, advice being given? Um, to avoid it by restarting the counter? Because that's something we addressed this morning. I just wanted to know if, if that jogged your memory at all. Well, I remember you mentioning about that being stated, but it's clear, uh, it's not advice I would give, ever give or agree with. Um, but it was mentioned in the pinnacle that yes. you received. Um, the symptoms of the problem are a large number of events. The peak advises that if the issue occurs more than once per month, then we would need to try and reproduce the issue. The KEL also refers to PC0083101. Past experience shows that Escher wouldn't consider bugs if they are not reproducible. Now, that's something I asked you about this morning. Um, do, do you think that that statement is right or wrong? So, so my take on that statement is that if the um, bug isn't reproducible, then it makes progressing the root cause analysis much, much more difficult. Um, but I can, I'm aware that uh, on at least one occasion, um, when there was a bug, a potential bug in the message server, uh, Andrew Sutherland came to Bracknell uh, to investigate it. So, um, so there's an example, I think, where we couldn't send him a reproducible case, but he attended a facility in Bracknell to investigate. Um, do you think that it was common knowledge uh, amongst those who, who worked on these issues um, that it wouldn't really be worth troubling Escher, um, and perhaps not troubling you, if it was a case of a bug that wasn't reproducible? Um, well, I, I think where, I mean, the objective is to understand the issue and to close it. Uh, and in the case where that can be done based on existing evidence, then that, that could be relatively straightforward. However, in many cases, a lot of effort needs to be expended in reproducing the problem to investigate it further. And I can think of a number of occasions when we had to do that. So I don't think, if, if a problem warrants investigation, then it needs to be investigated. And just because it's difficult to investigate it, isn't a reason not to investigate it. I mean, might it sometimes be called a once-off error if it couldn't be reproduced? Um, well, if, if it only ever happens once and it can't be reproduced, then yes, it could be labelled as it only happened once, yeah. Um, very briefly, continue. It says, the peak was then closed and the KEL J. Ballantyne 5245K produced. In particular, the KEL advises SMC, who monitor events from counters, that if such events are seen to phone the branch and advise them to restart the affected counter, and if they are balancing, to abandon the balance until the reboot has happened, as this prevents replication working correctly. Uh, we don't need to spend any more time on, on this particular document. We can ask those who are familiar with this document about the document itself. Um, I, I want to move on to 2001. 
and can we look at FUJ0008359 please? Um, so we're now in 2001, and can we go over the page? This is an email from Brian Orzel, um, who you mentioned earlier. It's to a, a limited number of people. Um, David Richardson, Chris Wannell, yourself, Gareth Jenkins, um, Lionel Higman. Who, who are those people? Um. I recognise the names, but I can't remember their roles. Is there, is there any significance um, after Gareth Jenkins' name? It says G G L or G I, or is it, could those be initials, perhaps? Uh, I, I, it, I think they're in initials in the e email address. Um, and this email says, gents, it will take a little time for the new users to bed in. Do you know who, who he's talking about? No. Yeah. Um, I am not actively working on anything in the control inbox or parked. If you have a pet pinnacle therein that you think I should be chasing, then come over and beat me up. Um, he, he lists below a, a large number of pinnacles. Um, and I think there's one, um, well, can, can you help me? If we scroll down and we can see that there are some that are parked, um, they have various names on, wh why would you be sent this? I think there's an, ex um, b because, I the only reason I think I would be sent this if there are some pinnacles that are assigned to me. Yes. Um, let, let's go to page one. It may assist us. And if we look at the bottom there, it's an email from Gareth Jenkins. Again, Gareth Jenkins directly to you. Mark, please can you have a look through the seven pinnacles in the list assigned to you? I suspect that many of them can either be closed or parked. I can supply more details about them if you have problems in getting through to Pinnacle. Um, what was Gareth Jenkins's role here? Um, I think he's just pointing out that some of the Pinnacles are assigned to me and that they've, I assume that they've been open for a while and need to be concluded. I mean, you, you're one of the original recipients that, uh, of the email that he's replying to you on or forwarding to you. Um, you would have seen the original email. Do, why would Gareth Jenkins particularly be asking you there about seven pinnacles in the list assigned to you? What was his role in relation to your role there? I can't think why he would be asking me to do this because uh, the you know, I, I can't think of a reason. Um, if we look over the page and look at that list, there are quite a lot that say at Escher. Um, now, would it be right to say that they couldn't be addressed by Fujitsu because they were reliant on Escher to provide the solution in, in some or all of those cases? Um, so the, I, I guess the important thing is that quite a bit of the code used in our solution did come from Escher. So in those cases, they would have to, they, they were quite rightly, if, it, if there's a problem with the code, it will, they would need to resolve it. Were you aware with issues obtaining code from Escher? We've heard about difficulties in obtaining the original code because of, uh, yes, intellectual so, property reasons or yes I wasn't referring to source code I was re referring to applications so for example what Azure provided us was the message server the uh, at, at one time there was a counter application they provided 
and they also provided the what the the overarching application that ran on the counter known as the desktop so if if we identified in our testing problems in those areas then the right place for it to be investigated would be uh, with Escher. Um, now we have quite a few at Escher. We also have some that are um, duplicates, I think, and also some that say parked. Is that is that right? So we're there onto the, some duplicates. Yes. And then if we keep on scrolling, I think there are quite a few that are parked as well. Uh, yes? So, so oh, some, sorry. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've seen both parked and duplicates, yes. Um, might some of those ones that were parked have been parked because they couldn't be reliably reproduced at that time? Um, I'm not sure of the criteria for going to a parked status as opposed to open. I, I didn't use Pinnacle as, as part of my kind of daily workflow, so I don't know what the, what the kind of workflow rules were for it. In, in relation to Gareth Jenkins, so if we go to the first page... Um, <coughs> is a fair description of this email that's being sent to him, um, an email that contains a list of outstanding bugs, errors, and defects with Horizon. So the, the email is, uh, looks to me to be a summary of uh, pinnacles, which are I guess in an open state, I, they haven't been closed. And the, in terms of what they're referring to, it, there, there could be a combination of bugs uh, or it, you know, seeking information. It's, it, it's hard just looking at the title to categorize what they fall into. Uh, perhaps a significant list of incidents being sent to Gareth Jenkins in 2001. Would you agree with that? Well, he, well, given that the purpose of the system was to... Well, so there's one example. Uh, it's quite fortunate in this email, Chris Wannell uh, is pointing out that there's a, a pinnacle which also refers to uh, an item which is on the RER, which is the Repost Enhancement Register. So Chris is saying, quite rightly, it shouldn't be a pinnacle because it's an enhancement request as opposed to uh, a design, uh, as opposed to the Azure code not working as it should. So there's just one example there, I think, of where the Pinnacle system's been used for something that is probably not really an instant. But I think in general, yes, the majority would be instants. Thank you. Can we go to FUJ00083600? Uh, moving now to the 11th of May of 2001. Um, now, this is an email, again, from Gareth Jenkins to yourself. And he says, I've received this pinnacle. I know I've raised it with you before, the question of error 82, though in the past it has been on counters. I'm also aware that the error itself is benign, though it could result in other errors uh, to agents, for example. And it gives some detail there. Um, Again, it refers in that detail to timeout um, occurred waiting for lock. So is this, again, a, a ripost lock issue? Uh, yeah, yes, it is. Um, and then if we look at the bottom final paragraph of this page. Gareth Jenkins says there, what I'm really asking is for confirmation that the associated errors are indeed benign in which case I can ensure that KELs are raised so as to suppress the reporting of them in future. It worries me 
that messages are failing to be inserted. However, if they're being replicated, then I guess it doesn't matter. Do, do you remember this email at all? Um, I didn't remember it until I, I saw the material early on in the week. Um, Gareth Jenkins there is talking about a, a large number um, uh, of errors in, in this particular case, and he's worried that they um, may not be benign. Is that a fair characterization of that final paragraph? Well, looking at the, the error messages, um, the, for example, the, the part way down the page, the third occurrence was somewhat different. The uh, repost error where there's a repost start transaction exception, that's uh, an, an error that hasn't, I'm not aware we have asked Escher about that before, so it would need to be followed up with them because it's uh, reporting uh, a problem with um, a repose function. But, but looking at, I mean, for example, at the, those first ones, it's very clear that some of them occur, uh, relate to the repost lock problem. Timeout occurred waiting for lock, the, the same y yes. error that we've heard a number of times this morning. Um, you knew Gareth Jenkins. Um, was his concern there genuine? Did you feel it was genuine? Did you feel his genuine general approach uh, to these kinds of issues was one of being worried, for example? <clears throat> so... I, I think his concern is, is genuine, um, and where he's asking for confirmation that the associated errors are indeed benign, um, I think it would be quite difficult to provide that confirmation based on what I'm seeing in front of me. And he's, he's looking to you for help there, isn't he? Um, well, he's asking me to, yes he is, and I would, have to ask Escher, I, can't ask, I cannot recall asking Escher about that particular message, but I would have to ask them, and then provide, but in, in, in the previous ex ex explanation, I did state to Gareth that where Escher confirmed that from a message store perspective, there, it's unlikely there was an adverse impact. The, from an application point of view, it's very important to confirm that the application is checking all the return codes. Uh, so he, he was aware of the information you had passed yes. him earlier, but yet he's still asking in um, 2001, I think that's May 2001, um, can you just ch really please check uh, whether they are benign? I mean, the, the thing is, what I, can, what I can see happening just under the third occurrence for a somewhat different section, it states, that error message states that that particular function failed. Therefore, an application was trying to do something and it failed. So the, it really depends on what the consequences of that are. So based on what I see in front of me, I could never confirm that as benign. I would need to ask someone to look into what was happening at the time. That, that would be my recommendation. And I think you've said that you, you don't recall following that up. No, not this one. Um, I mean... I, 
I just cannot recall discussing this issue. Let's move to the 7th of August 2001, FUJ 00083608, please. <clears throat> so here we are, August 2001. We have an email to yourself from Gareth Jenkins. I think you're the, the, the recipient. There are a couple of people copied in there. Um, he sends you a Escher Dev Pinnacle stack. Um, those are listed there. And can we look down at the bottom? Many of them relate to, seem to relate to Ripost. Um, he says, I know the last one is assigned to me, but I sent you an email about it in July and I'm about uh, to reassign it to you. Uh, the current situation on most of them, I believe, is that they're one-off problems, and perhaps we should consider closing them. If you want help in accessing the pinnacles or their history, then please let me know. Again, I mean, he seems to be asking you for guidance there, isn't he? Or assistance, at least. Y yes, he is, uh, because in, in general, with the Ripos message server, at that time we did need to liaise directly with Escher to get advice so that that's what I would be doing um, and it says that I believe that they are one-off problems does this go back to the reproducible issue that perhaps they were ones that couldn't be reproduced um, so I, I think the use of the term one-off applies to how of them being observed only once because there could be a problem which is happening regularly but it's still difficult to reproduce it in a development environment to diagnose it further. But does that rely on somebody connecting all the dots from the once-off incidents though to work out whether there are common themes? Oh, most, most definitely, yes, it does. A lot of data analysis would be needed. Let's move to the 2nd of May, um, FUJ 00083621. Um, now we're looking at the bottom of that page, Pinnacle PC 0075892. Again, that's one that's been linked to the calendar square issue. Um, let's look over the page to page two. And you have the customer call there, 2nd of May 2002. Um, can we scroll down a little bit? It says there, an, un an unexpected error occurred while attempting to insert a message. Timeout occurred, waiting for lock. Again, we hear that same phrase, timeout occurred, waiting for lock. Um, can we go over the page, please? Towards the bottom of that page, you have John Simpkins again, 2nd of May um, at 4.03 p.m. Uh, these events have stopped occurring now and the Tivoli monitoring can be restarted. The events started at 5.29 on the 1st of May 2002 after the counter was rebooted. The counter produced one of these messages every 10 seconds throughout the night until clear desk restarted repost at 03.34. This cleared the lock and the system has been fine since. Uh, and then over the page... Page four, another substantive entry by John Simpkins, appears to be similar to a problem we had on the correspondence servers some time back when a lock on the checkpoint would kill agents. Um, attached application log as evidence, passing to development for comments. And then we look at page one, uh, and this is again a pinnacle that's sent to Gareth Jenkins, and again it's got Gareth Jenkins uh, asking you for follow-up questions. This time we're now in August, uh, in May, sorry, 2002. 
Um, again, Gareth Jenkins seems to be asking you for your opinion. He says, any thoughts on this one? Unless there's something obvious to investigate, I suggest we'll probably need to write this off as a one-off. Is it worth trying to find out why the machine was rebooted? Um, so he, he doesn't seem there to be asking you uh, simply to make contact with Riposte. He does seem to be asking you for your substantive opinion on a particular problem, doesn't he? In, in, th in this case, the, um, I think we would need to confirm what those, we, the right course of action would be to seek confirmation from Mesha what those error messages mean um, and what the consequences are. Yes. I mean, time and time again, we've seen emails from Gareth Jenkins to yourself. Um, He's not just asking you to contact Escher and be the message man. I mean, he's really asking you for your thoughts on this particular problem. But, but the only way I could contribute a, a, to the conversation with Gareth would be to liaise with Escher, because without any documentation on their message server, the only way I can gain knowledge is by, by speaking with Escher. He's saying there that he'll need to write this off, uh, probably need to write it off as a once-off. Uh, again, I mean, this is a problem with riposte um, in the error message. Um, I, I imagine sub-postmasters will be asking how many once-offs make something not a once-off. What, what isn't in the email it, it, it is any context about what the application was doing at the time, if anything? We're on, this phase is focused on rollout, 2000, uh, et cetera. Um, we know that the calendar square bug continued uh, until at least 2006. There was an S90 software fix. Is that something you're aware of? No. Um, it had the potential to cause discrepancies. Uh, shouldn't this uh, riposte lock issue have been front and centre of your witness statement? Um, so... So my, when I produced the initial witness statement at the time, my recollection of the repost errors were, as I described, requesting information from Escher as to what they mean and what the consequences could be. I mean, the, the picture that's built up this morning is that you were quite involved in this particular issue, weren't you? Even though we, we've focused on this, it was a very small part of my normal role within the program. Um, these continued problems with the repost lock, do you know if anyone was feeding those problems back to the post office? I, 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 I don't know, and I, and I don't think I would know. Um, did you ever... Could the document be taken down, please? Um, did you ever speak to any sub-postmasters directly about repost issues with repost no thank you so those are all my questions um mr jacobs i think is first thank over you over to you mr jacobs thank you sir can i just check you can see me and that you can hear me i can yes thank you mr jowish um i have some questions for you um on behalf of 153 sub postmasters um who um were um pursued by a post office for shortfalls that were apparent, uh, which they couldn't check. Um, I want to ask you about replication. Um, in your statement at paragraph 21D, um, if we could call that up on the screen, it's WIT N0481010, page 10 of 22. 
Thank you, Paige. Just waiting for it to come up on the screen. Um, thank you. So the purpose, um, it, um, you talk about um, an approach taken whereby messages were replicated and the system created multiple copies of a message on each message store. Is that right? So on each count, so on each counter apart, so on each counter there was a single message store. Yes. And if there are two or more counters in a branch, then each of those counters would have its own message store. And the repost behavior was to, if a message got created on the third counter, it would be replicated to every other counter in the branch. Right. And I think the position is that if one counter was down, the other counter would, in inverted, in inverted commas, know the message on the counter that wasn't functioning. So, so in that scenario, if, um, if, if replication is working correctly, then each counter gets a copy of messages from every other counter and also from the correspondence servers in the data center. So within a given message store, yes, you see messages for every counter and the correspondence servers. Um, the reason I've been asked to ask this question is because many of our clients, um, when they gave evidence uh, in the inquiry in February to March of this year, came up with a quite a similar issue where um, they would have a shortfall, say, for example, £2,000. Um, they'd go into the system to try and resolve it, and it would come up at £4,000, and then it would come up at £8,000, and it would keep replicating. And um, the question I have is... Um, were there, or could it, could it be the case that these replicated shortfalls arose from the replication system that you've described not working correctly um, in addition to or alternatively to the bugs, errors and defects that we know about? Um, so, I think... I'd answer in two parts. The first part is, if the um, if the replication wasn't working correctly, then there could be a number of scenarios. For example, uh, some counters would be missing messages from other counters, possibly because of a n the, the network in the branch was partitioned. So, so I th I think a plausible scenario, which is I can envisage would be in a, a multi-counter office. If the network gets partitioned anyway, then uh, some counters won't be able to replicate to other counters. Now, the in terms of how that would manifest itself, it would mean that the, the counters which cannot reach a gateway have no online communication with the data center. So there might be some observable instant as a result of that. Um, it, it depends what proportion of transactions were online and what proportions were performed locally. And if that did happen, if the system got stuck in this way and there was no connectivity, I think your evidence is that there was something called a gateway node so that everything would sort of feed back in once it was restored. Is there a possibility, is it plausible that that, that part of the process could lead to sub-postmasters having, um, having their shortfalls doubling up through a malfunction of this part of the system? Um, so the, the, the special role of the gateway is that it's the only counter which communicates with the correspondence servers at the data center. Um, so in, in, this, in the scenario I described of the network <coughs> kind of being partitioned, what that would mean is that the gateway and some other counters would have a would have messages being created and communicate with the data center, whereas some other counters would be isolated and therefore their messages wouldn't be replicated until the network was restored. So the, there will be different messages in different parts of the network. In terms of the consequences of that on the application, unfortunately I can't 
I don't have no expertise in that, and the application will interpret that scenario. Um, but from, certainly from a network point of view, that could happen. And the thing I would mention, of course, is that in a single counter office, there's only one counter, it's the gateway counter. And in that case, there's two repost message servers on the counter replicating to each other. And the reason for that is, should that counter fail, then it has a removable drive, so the replacement one can be uh, initialized from that. So I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that although you're not able to be absolutely clear, it's possible that the scenario that I've described could have arisen from a, malfunct a malfunction of this part of the system. Yes, definitely, because e even though in my witness statement I state how it's designed to work, clearly networks do fail for periods of time, and therefore this partitioning can occur. Thank you. Um, the, the next um, question that I have for you um, relates to um, uh, connectivity in remote areas. And this is in relation to paragraph 38B of your statement, which is, again, the same um, reference WIT N04810100, paragraph 38B, please. Um, paragraph 17, uh, page 17, sorry, of 22. And um, we can see uh, towards the bottom of that section, you say, I recall there are about 140 branches um, in which we couldn't use ISDN as the branches were very remote. In these cases, IS, as ISDN wasn't available, we used VSAT. Now, we know from above that means very small aperture terminal as an alternative means of connection, and it's effectively a satellite connection. And as with any network solution, its reliability depends on the context in which it is de deployed. For instance, VSAT reliability can be affected by inclement weather. And again, the reason I'm asking this question is it arises from experiences of some of our clients who say that they experienced um, power outages and um, shortfalls arose um, often after there were power outages. Now, what I wanted to ask you is, um, you said here that um, VSAT reliability can be affected by inclement weather. What sort of weather conditions would affect um, that reliability? Um, rain and snow, for example, they, because they attenuate the signal. So this is to do with... Um, and you say that um, as with any network position, its reliability depends on the context in which it's deployed. Um, what were the other issues that, have, that affected VA, VSAT reliability? Um, so as, as well as the, the weather conditions, um, the, the VSAT um, service that we used um, was from a single provider. Yeah. Um, slightly different to the ISDN service where, because it's geographically distributed, there are multiple exchanges being used. So if the provider, for example, has some problem in their network, uh, then it could affect all or multiple branches that relied on VSAT for communications for, for the period of time that that problem persisted. Okay. And do you accept, because of this, those who were in rural areas were more vulnerable to difficulties with the system than other sub-postmasters? Um, the... So I'm trying to think what characteristics would be affected by rural areas. So certainly um, the um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a characteristic of the network which was affected by this rural, distance from exchange or VSAT. Um, I, 
I'm, I'm struggling to come up with a plausible scenario which would differentiate network characteristics. There, there may be one, just I cannot think one off okay. the top of my head. Well, I'll move to my next um, question. Um, could an unstable connection affect post office systems or balances? Well, it, it, so an unstable connection with... Th we're talking about the connection from the gateway now into the data, data centre yeah. as opposed to within the branch. Um, so it will certainly affect message replication between the branch and the data centre. And um, the so it would manifest itself as uh, the, where either the data centre or the branch need to communicate with each other because they need to exchange messages for some application reason but they are unable to or it happens intermittently so that that will certainly happen and again the consequences of that on the, on the application uh, obviously depend on the application but yes okay, thank you I'm just going to see if I have anything else to ask that covers all the questions I have thank you very much Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, some questions from me, please, sir. Very well. Uh, I'm Flora Page. I'm also acting for a number of the so sub postmaster core participants. Uh, and I'm also going to focus on what I understand to have been your responsibility, which was the network solution. Uh, and uh, your, that means, doesn't it, that you were responsible for the design of the counters communicating with the central data hubs. Is that right? Yes, for the, for the network service that we provided to enable that communication to take place. Uh, and have you had a chance to look at a section of the report from uh, Mr. Charles Scipioni, which he headed uh, with the, the, the title, many post office branches were disconnected from the central system during national rollout. Does that ring a bell at all? We can bring it up. No, no it doesn't. But, um, I mean, what I would say is in general that bran branches being disconnected from the central system would happen when, the, for example, there was an ICN outage which is why we had other solutions in place to deal with that. Well, let's just, um, if, if we can, we'll bring up EXPG, and then it has six zeros and then one, and this is Mr. Scipioni's report. And if we look at page 83, please. <laughs> So we see that heading there. Um, it, it may be a slight, um, it, t it takes perhaps a little bit of unpacking. He, he talks about how the design uh, used, in that second paragraph, he talks about the design feature was a telecommunication system uh, which depended on ISDN or in some cases satellite links. And I think that ties up with what you've already told us, doesn't it? And um, it says at 10.1.3 that the monthly reports indicate throughout 1998 and 1999 that ICL Pathway was concerned with their ability to effectuate this design feature. They were concerned with BT's coverage of the UK as well as other technical issues related to their standards. And then it says in the following paragraph, 10.1.4, during the national rollout, these problems were realised hardware, network availability, and user issues combined to create a situation where ICL Pathway was occupied with a higher than expected amount of non-polling branches. Uh, he explains that there's two problems associated with that. Problematic because, one, it relied on the telecommunication design aspect to collate and centralise information on all the activity of the branches, but also to allow for efficient updates of software to the branches. Does that make sense to you? It, it does, yes. All right, so the polling, that's just a terminology for the branches connecting to the central server, isn't it? The central servers. Yes. Um, and he then goes on a bit further on in this section to, uh, to, to provide statistics on the numbers of branches which were not polling or didn't poll for significant periods of time. 
and um, and he's already identified there, hasn't he, the issues that result from that. The former one being the data not actually matching up, so things, things not getting to the central data which should have done from the counters. Is that fair? Yes, if, if, if they, they were disconnected, then that would happen, yeah. Were you conscious at the time of rollout, and surely you should have been, that non-polling was an issue? I wasn't conscious that there was a higher, I wasn't conscious that it was a higher than expected amount of non-polling branches, but non-polling was a, a, a consequence of the network solution because there was no resilient network in, at this point in time. So I'm, I'm thinking of this period of time up to 2000, there was no network resilience for branches. So if the primary network service wasn't functioning, then there'll be non-polling. Uh, this was one of the reasons for introducing the, uh, uh, the manual backup process. And when was that introduced? I'm, I'm not sure when that was deployed, but th th this, this was the process when an engineer would go to the branch and uh, use alternative uh, telecommunication services, uh, either um, wireless or PSCN, to connect the branch to the data centre. And you can't tell us when that was? Are we talking months, years after rollout? Um, I'd have to check when it was deployed, but it, it uh, is this national. No, I'm I'm struggling to understand. National it, rollout was sort of through '99 and 2000. 2000 was when it really began okay. in a big way. So I would have to check when the, the this manual solution I ex explained was deployed. I just don't know when it was deployed. No, all right. Well, is it possible that non-polling would have continued as an issue until Horizon Online, or is that wrong? Um, so, the the original re reason for for using ISDN as a network uh, technology, one of the justifications was that the most of the transactions didn't require an online connection to be carried out, albeit they did need to synchronize. When we move, when we, when the change was made to not do um, the, the benefit transactions, but to move to uh, network banking, then the, the, the whole network approach changed. And at that point, we were looking at having a backup technology integrated. So, there will be a primary network type and a backup network within each branch. So we're, we're talking, are we, about the post office's attempts to move into different areas because the benefit agency revenue stream was no longer yes. going to be there? And the consequence of the network being that the network had to be there for those transactions to take place, as opposed to it was more of a batch system where the transactions could take place and then get synchronised later, so yes. So network banking was going to require being constantly on, was it, as opposed to the intermittent yeah, uh, yes. design? Yes, yes. Uh, and, and did that ever come to pass before Horizon Online? Well, yeah, it yes. did. And can you give us an idea of when that was? Um, so I've got the timescales here. I can just look them up. So the, the, the network changes which introduced um, the, the diagram I'm looking at here starts in 2006. So I'm just trying to 
what, I don't have the information about exactly what happened before that, but suddenly in 2006 is when we started um, rolling out the uh, branch network device um, which had integrated backup. And so that was going to be fully on all the time instead of the, the polling issue? Uh, yeah, yes, most definitely. And in fact, we, we did introduce fully on much earlier than that. As soon as we went to online banking, we moved away from ISCN intermittent to ISCN nailed up. And, and again, can you say when that was? Um, not accurately, we, not without checking, but it would have been prior to introduction of any online banking because it wouldn't have been possible to do it over the ISCN network All right. on demand. So for a period of some, presumably some years at least, after rollout in 2000, there was still this intermittent service with the occasional uh, non-polling incidents. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let me just then, uh, just a few questions to uh, bottom out what non-polling meant and, and how it would have uh, affected sub-postmasters. So um, if we look at page 87 of the, the document that's up, And we scroll down, thank you, to um, a summary of that one that's actually at the bottom of the page, so we can stay there. These, this is a list of extracts from um, Pinnacles, and the one that's dated the 4th of January of 2000 explains um, a, a sort of a typical example. This office is still not polling and hasn't polled for 11 days. Please resolve ASAP. Missing objects relating to EPOS rec were inserted today by P. Carroll. The PO should disappear from the non-polling report tomorrow. So what we're seeing there is the effect of non-polling is that one can have missing objects, in other words, missing transactions. Is that right? Um, the... I mean, based on the non-polling report showing that this particular post office wasn't able to communicate with the data center, then, uh, then any objects created in the data center would not have made it to the post office, and similarly in the other direction. So that's, that's what would happen if there was no communication. Um, And so the, the uh, result here is that objects have had to be inserted. In other words, transactions have had to be put into the accounts, haven't they? Um, well, I, I think, so my immediate thought on reading this is that I recall that after a number of days of non-polling, there was meant to be a process in place to try to synchronize the post office with the data center. So that's what I would have expected to be the normal as design solution behavior for this. Um, in terms of what's happened here, clearly that, that didn't take place or wasn't successful. Um, so I can see that the, the individual, uh, who, who I know who he is, is stating that he had to put in uh, the, some missing data. What I cannot tell from this is, uh, whether that missing data is something he had to insert in the data center. But it, I, 
on the basis that the branch is non-polling, it would mean that he, he it would have to be there because he cannot communicate with the branch. But what I cannot tell from reading this is whether this is a uh, an approved workaround or whether this is a one-off because the as designed solution would be for someone to attend that office with the uh, the special laptop to uh, attempt to for it to synchronize with the data center. Was there a, a, a process for making sure this person with the special laptop arrived? Yes, there's a whole solution around this. Um, I think it's called Day D solution. Uh, Say that again, sorry, Day? I, I think, it, I, I recall it's called the Day D solution. Day D solution. Yeah. I... Would the sub postmaster uh, in the run up to this have received some any, any alert or any message? I'm not sure what the operational service was around how this was deployed. I mean, clearly to gain access to the post office, there would have to be some kind of communication, but I'm not sure what the service process okay. was. And absent um, a, a sort of a human intervention, somebody arriving with the special laptop, was there any uh, system built in, automated, if you like, that would tell postmasters when they weren't polling? Um, I, I don't know. There certainly could have been very easily, but I don't know if that was actually deployed on the counter because clearly the uh, any, any it would be very easy on the counter to detect that this is happening. But whether it was put in place or not, I don't know. And who would have been responsible for that? Um, the so that would be in the as part of the counter development team. So the. So I think that would be, at the time, Gareth was the counter t and repose TDA, so he would have been aware of that, or it could have been one of the application people. I'm, I'm really not sure if even if there's anything put in place like that. And was there any liaison with your team over thinking through the implications uh, of this so that uh, your team obviously being responsible for the network side of it and, and Gareth's team thinking about it from the point of view of the counter application, was there uh, effective liaison to make sure that sub postmasters would receive the right sort of messages that might say, for example, you haven't polled for a number of days, there's a risk of missing transactions? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that took place or not. You don't recall anyway having those kind of conversations? No. and. I probably wouldn't have been involved in them if they were, so I wouldn't expect to be involved in them. Who would have been involved with them on the network side? So we had a, a network designers uh, at the time of doing that solution. That that was a David Tanner. So from a network design point of view, it would have been him. It would have also been a customer service because this is a service related matter. So they would have been involved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I don't think there are any other questions. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Jarosz, for coming to the inquiry and answering all the questions which you put in. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, are you content for us to all take an hour's lunch now rather than starting the next witness and interrupting? Of course, them? yes. Thank you. So perhaps we could come back at, at half past one? Yeah, by all means. Thank you very much.